The first three studio albums from this legendary band that taught us how to rock were actually commercial disappointments. It was so bad their record label was circling the drain. It was a, a desperate time for sure for the principal songwriters of this rock group to create a song that would vault them to superstardom and keep the band going for the long haul. So they reached deep within themselves and they generated the perfect rock anthem and it died on the charts. <laughs> Desperate to prove themselves again, the head of the record label hatched a plan to take their live show and bring it inside the bedroom of every teenager in America. It would change music history. Get the story coming up next. Hey music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever uh, snuck uh, a controversial album or song single into your room as a teenager and listened to it in your headphones as not to alert your parents, you're gonna dig this channel. Music nostalgia all the time, we remember the great ones, interviews straight from the legends, Make sure to subscribe below so you never miss an episode of our daily features. Check the box and all that good stuff. Also, check out our Patreon. Uh, that helps us to curate this history. It's time for another episode from our series, Number One in Our Hearts. This is where we zero in on a song that was so great, it should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100, but for reasons that we'll discuss here, it came up a little bit short. You know, arguably, the most notorious live act of the rock era was Kiss. The band that, that really taught us how to rock. We've covered them a couple of times on here. But as the slogan sounded before Kiss hit the stage at all their concerts, you wanted the best, you got the best. The iconic foursome of Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, Ace Freely, and Peter Chris, the original, they pioneered the, the spectacle of pyrotechnic and costume rock. On a riveting stage of shooting rockets, Exploding bombs, fire breathing, blood spewing, <laughs> levitating drums, and smoking guitars, of course, can't leave that out. The KISS Army actually started building with an audience of less than 10 people that actually attended their first live performance at the old Popcorn Club in Queens, New York. KISS was paid uh, a measly $50 to perform two sets that night. They got the gig after Gene Simmons cold called the venue booker, convincing him to hire the band for a three night stand. The four members of KISS each wore makeup for the three inaugural shows in Queens, but their signature facial character designs, uh, those were not unveiled until a few months later at a concert at the Daisy in Amityville, New York. On the strength of their wild live set, the KISS army swelled with a cult-like following especially in the, the northeastern section of the Midwest America called the Rust Belt. On the strength of their, their wild live set, Kiss was signed to Casablanca Records and dropped their eponymous debut album in 1974. The self-titled Kiss album did not have a hit single, and it rose only as high as number 87 on the Billboard 200 album chart, despite growing significance as a, as a cool touring entity. Kiss's follow-up album, Hotter Than Hell, released later that same year, was an even bigger disappointment, if you can believe that. Peaked at uh, number 100, and it just quickly dropped off the charts. Hot, hot, I mean, try as they might, they just couldn't break through to the masses. Meanwhile, though, their, their record label, the infamous Casablanca Records, was in deep, deep trouble. After grabbing the limelight, you know, as a heavy of the disco era, the leader of Casablanca, Neil Bogart and his minions, they made some colossal blunders that nearly ruined the label. One of them was releasing a double album of audio highlights from The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. That package was a disaster that affected every act that was signed to Casablanca, including Kiss. Kiss was the first act to be signed by Casablanca, but the company, as I've said, was primarily known as a disco label. With acts like Donna Summer, Cher, Lips Inc., and The Village People, it was an inauspicious home for a future Hall of Fame rock band. The lukewarm sells are hotter than hell, and the overall insolvency of the label put Casablanca's leader, Neil Bogart, on the offensive. As soon as the Hotter Than Hell tour ended, Bogart wanted Kiss to immediately go back to the studio and record a new album. His directive was for Kiss to create 
an anthem. You know, speaking passionately to them, an anthem was the type of song that the, the band was missing. And actually, the inspiration for the Kiss anthem was Come On, Feel the Noise, the original version of the song performed by the British band Slade. It was a huge number one hit in the UK in 1973. And this was, of course, 10 years before Quiet Riot remade the song and rode that version in number five on the Billboard Hot 100. We've covered that one before. The track Kiss came up with that they thought fit the criteria perfectly was a little thing called Rock and Roll All Night. It would end up being exactly what Bogart had ordered. Paul Stanley wrote the chorus, and Gene Simmons wrote the verses, borrowing parts of a song he'd previously written entitled Drive Me Wild. You drive us wild, we'll drive you crazy. For the choruses, the band and Bogart brought in a large group of outside contributors to you know, sing and clap, including members of the Kiss Road crew, studio musicians, and the cat man, Peter Chris's wife, Lydia. Some of the road crew members used their jacket zippers to create sound effects on that recording. Pretty cool. And that's how it was back in the you know, 50s and the 60s and the 70s. You had to think outside of the box to get that certain sound, that kind of ingenuity. It's what's missing from contemporary pop and rock, you know, where you can get a sample of any sound known to man. It just takes away that creativity. I think that. Anyway. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Okay, so Rock and Roll All Night was one of two tracks of the group recorded toward the end of the Hotter Than Hell tour prior to returning to Electric Lady Studios for the official recording sessions for Dress to Kill. Rock and Roll All Night was originally released on Kiss's third album, like I said, Dress to Kill. However, despite the song's uh, party mantra, I want to rock and roll all night and party every day, the track did not become the anthem that it was conceived to be. Rock and Roll Night was released as the lead single from the album, and the party was over in April of 75 when the single stalled quickly at a very disappointing number 68 on the Billboard All 100. The album Dressed to Kill fared a lot better than its two predecessors, though, but it was another Kiss record that produced, add it up here, zero hits. The second single from the LP, Come In and Love Me, didn't even crack the top 100. So with the writing on the wall, in a last-ditch effort to save the label, Bogart decided to capitalize on Kiss's onstage notoriety once and for all and have the band record a, a live album. Kiss's manager, Bill O'Coin, uh, was receptive toward the idea because he felt the band could finally achieve the sound that they, they strove for. He also liked the fact that a, a live recording would be less expensive than a studio recording. It was collectively a, a brilliant business decision bringing the band back from really certain death. Kiss's landmark concert album, Alive, that peaked at number nine on the Billboard Top 200 album charts and it charted for an amazing 110 weeks, by far the longest in the band's history. Alive is considered to be the real breakthrough for Kiss and a milestone for future live music albums. It was such an, an influence on so many that came after it. The double album was also an homage to Slade's live LP, Slade Alive in 72. As we go into the rest of the story, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I wear every day. <laughs> you can customize your eyewear with a prescription lens or non-prescription lens if you just want the cool look or a color of a particular style of lens. Spice up your style today by ordering at zenny.com. Okay, so Alive ended up becoming the biggest selling Kiss album ever. It moved over 9 million units since its release in 75. A live performance of Rock and Roll All Night was recorded for Alive during a Kiss concert with a ravenous sold out audience at Kobo Arena in Detroit on May 16th of 75. And it was released as the lead single from Alive just six months after the studio version. <laughs> The raging live version of Rock and Roll Night? It was a supercharged overhaul of the studio version that manifested all the, the exhilaration and firepower of a Kiss concert. And the public responded in mass salute. 
transforming the song into the rock anthem that the, the band envisioned and that Casablanca held their breath for. Rock and Roll All Night rode the fire all the way to number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100 in early 1976. Its legacy is a timeless classic rock crusade firmly in place that is it's number one in our hearts. There's so many reasons why the live version of Rock and Roll All Night is just superior to the original. First of all, Gene Simmons takes center stage for the lead vocal on Rock and Roll All Night. And it's, it's the perfect call to match the song's raw intensity with a vocal that is not just slick or, or refined. It's just Gene, painted as the demon delivering an honest proposition. You drive us wild, we'll drive you crazy. There's the confident swagger of the star child, Paul Stanley, strutting his stuff as the great front man that he is, working the crowd into a frenzy with his onstage rallying. So let's rock and roll all night and party every day. Come on and yelling, I can't hear you. You know, all that stuff. Right before Ace Freely unleashes his fiery guitar attack, it's just amazing. Freely's guitar solo has far surpassed the studio version of Stan as the definitive arrangement of rock and roll all night. No question. Ace, the spaceman, humbly called the solo a nice Chuck Berry kind of solo, reminiscent of older rock and roll tunes. Very cool tip of the hat to rock and roll's premier pioneer. Ultimately, the energy of 12,000 rabid fans shouting the I want to rock and roll all night and party every day chorus is really what makes the track the anthem that was always intended to be. When a teenager growing up in the 70s bought a copy of Alive at a, at a record store and took it home to play on their turntable, they were in essence bringing Kiss's explosive live show straight into their bedroom or their living room. Now, I wasn't a teen in the 70s, but I distinctly remember my uncle introducing me to this, this album as a, as a little kid. And I was just set on fire by this band. Ear ringing, jaw dropping, face melting rock and roll brought to you by a, a group of menacing rockers who made your elders a little nervous. <laughs> When you're part of the KISS Army, you're in a special league with other freaks and geeks alike. And let's face it, KISS, they were like the Beatles of the 70s. I'm not saying in terms of quality of music here. I'm saying just in their influence and in their impact on, on teens, many of whom would start a rock band days after hearing this very album. I mean, I've witnessed it firsthand. All the interviews that I've done, many of the, the biggest rock bands that came of age after the 70s, they've said as much. Just like the Beatles when they appeared on Ed Sullivan. Oh, yeah. Every 10 years or so, a band comes along just like that. that changes everything and starts thousands of bands overnight. Kiss was undoubtedly a band like that. Not many in the history of the era can lay claim to such an explosive live album. Alive was exactly that, alive. It made the experience more than just listening to a record. It made it an escape from reality. One would think that rock and roll all night is about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I'm certain two of these themes were meant to be encouraged in the song, but actually according to the authors, not the drugs part. In a radio interview uh, some years ago, Paul Stanley as a co-writer stated that rock and roll all night was not about partying with drugs and alcohol. It was just actually a song of celebration. Paul's writing sidekick Gene Simmons has often admitted publicly that he does not approve of what he termed the ingestion of uh, psychoactive drugs and alcohol. Since its release, the Alive album has been rumored to have included a lot of studio overdubbing and wasn't entirely live. Kiss's frenetic stage presence did not translate well to their first live record. Stanley and Simmons had several miscues, such as playing the wrong chords, 
and knocking over mics and not singing directly into the mic. Legendary producer Eddie Kramer, who was behind the live, the album, he knew that significant dubbing was needed to make the LP fit the vibe. For many years, Kiss denied the use of dubbing on a live. It wasn't until, I think it was 2003, episode of Ultimate Albums that Kiss admitted to overdubbing. In that particular episode, Paul Stanley said, what we felt was necessary was to capture the energy of the performance, not necessarily having it note for note of what actually happened. Gene Simmons would go on to say, most people assume it was all live. It wasn't. And you know what? For me, I really don't care if the live version of Rock and Roll Night included some overdubbing. It does everything it is supposed to do. It rocked when I was six years old. It rocked when I was 16 years old. It still rocks today. Rock and Roll Night, it's just a classic rock powerhouse. Uh, an instant lightning bolt of adrenaline that deserved better on the charts at a time when radio was changing. So the top five songs of the week that uh, Kiss peaked were uh, I Love Music Part 1 by the OJs at number five. I love music. Sweet, sweet. Love to Love You Baby by the great one, Donna Summer at number four. Love Roller Coaster by the Ohio Players at number three. I Write the Songs by Mr. Barry Manilow at number two. I write the songs that make the whole. And the number one song for January 24th, 1976 was the theme from Mahogany, You Know Where You're Going To by Diana Ross. Do you like the things that life has shown? I gotta say, I haven't heard that one in a while. Um, certainly almost 50 years later, Kiss's classic call to arms stands, uh, it's a little taller, certainly in terms of play and impact. The charts didn't reflect the revolution that was happening in, in bedrooms, in living rooms, in cars across the nation, when a rock and roll all night and Kiss Alive was just shaking the foundations of the earth. So we honor it as number one in our hearts today. Truth is, for many years, Kiss was in a, a two-way tie with Rush for the biggest Rock and Roll Hall of Fame snub in recent history. They were eligible in 1999, and they waited another 15 years before finally getting inducted. You wanted the best, and you got the best. The hottest band in the world, Kiss! Thing is, there's no doubt that Kiss is a unanimous first ballot inductee in the People's Hall of Fame a Hall of Fame that is really one in the stadiums, in our headphones, in our greatest youthful memories. The long live the KISS Army. Hey, leave us a comment about this legendary band below. Tell us your memories of discovering KISS for the first time, hearing this record for the first time. Are you a member of the KISS Army? Share all your memories below. Now, if you like our content, we do invite you to be a permanent part of our, our, our community by subscribing below. Make sure to check the bell so you never miss out. Also check us out on Patreon. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.